Well, hi, I'm Scott. I'm one of the pastors here at Marco Presbyterian Church, and we're so grateful that you've landed here. We intend for this content to be used in conjunction with a local church that you belong to so that you might grow in the Lord. If you're not connected to a church, please connect here to Marco Presbyterian Church. And if you're blessed by this content, consider giving to Marco Church. We love you and we want you to be blessed. We hope that this brings hope. privilege to be here. It's also a privilege to have a Bible in front of you and encourage you to open it to Philippians chapter 3, which is where we'll be today. We've been in a series called The Joy-Filled Life, and we're looking in the book of Philippians to answer the question, how can we live a joy-filled life? We've seen that it means living a life inside out. Uh, we've seen that joy is often upside down in God's economy. We've seen that joy is a life poured out and finally, we've even just seen simply that it's a life in Christ. And so what we're doing is pressing ahead to try to unpack what it means to live a joy-filled life. And what we're going to find today, I think, is that uh, God has already taken hold of us. Will you take hold of him? There was a gentleman born in the 60s. His name is Richard Hoyt. Many of you have heard this story, but in the 60s he was born uh, with cerebral palsy. And the doctors told his parents when he was born that he would be a vegetable. So go ahead and put him in a, uh, an institution because he'll never have any function. And his parents didn't agree. His parents didn't like that word, and so they were obstinate and stubborn. And later, uh, as they went to the hospitals to try to figure out, uh, somewhere around age 11, Richard was able to speak through the use of a computer and uh, the doctors in the room continued to say, look, uh, we think that he's going to be a vegetable his whole life. You might as well put him in an institution. So his dad said, also named Richard, tell him a joke. <laughs> and so they did. And Richard, the son, laughed. At age 11, they were able to give him a computer where he could speak. And his first words, he's living in Massachusetts at the time, were, go Bruins. <laughs> so this child, this 11-year-old with cerebral palsy was finally able to begin not only to speak but to learn the alphabet and his mother helped him to understand better the world. When he was in high school, there was an area 5K run which was raising money for a child with disabilities and the son Richard asked his dad, so we'll call them Dick and Rick, that's what they go by, I'd like to do that. His dad described himself as portly and hardly able to run a mile, let alone 3.2 miles. But after thinking about it for a little bit, he thought, well, this is a good way to get my son involved. And they did. Dick ran the 5K with his son, Rick, in a wheelchair, 3.2 miles. At the end of the race, uh, his, his father, Dick, asked Rick, what did you think of the race? And Dick simply answered, uh, Rich, Rick simply answered like this, Dad, and he's typing this, when we were running, it felt like I wasn't disabled anymore. And that moment for Dick, it changed the rest of his life. And so for decades and tons of races, they ran over a thousand races together with Dick running and Rick sitting in a wheelchair. Or they ran a triathlon as well, a dinghy, or on that triathlon, a, a specially made uh, seat for a bike. Can you imagine being a 25-year-old uh, man 
swimming in the triathlon out in Hawaii and you're passed up by a 60-something-year-old man with an adult son in a dinghy? That was happening. After decades and decades of running, in fact, they declared that 2013 would be their last Boston Marathon. They had run several. And 2013 was the year when the bomb was set off in the marathon. And so they, in fact, came back and ran in 2014. You can read about all of this, but I hope that you'll see this picture, this image of a son being carried by the father. The son has nothing to contribute to the race and that they've finished thousands of races. And I think what we'll find today is that as we read Scripture, we continue to see that God holds you and me. Will you hold on to, will you cling to God himself? And so let's stand up and read Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Up on the screen, you'll find that text in the New International Version. Most of our Bibles in the pews, the seats here, are the English Standard Version, which we like better usually, but today I want you to see this twist of verb so you can read up on the screen and still follow along in your text. It says this, Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let me pray for us. You can be seated. Our Father, we're grateful that you give us the opportunity, the privilege to read your word. We pray that you would change us by it today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we think uh, through uh, what this text means for us, what we're going to see, uh, guys, sorry, go ahead and have a seat. We would love to sit. Do you want to stand the whole time? It'd be kind of like straining. It'd be a, a word picture of striving and straining for the Lord. What we want to do is see that a joy-filled life is, in fact, a sinner seized by God. What we, what we are finding as we press on through the Bible here, and I, I, I said this at the 9 o'clock too, I'm, I'm maybe working myself out of a job here, uh, because what we're finding is that in every text we're reading, it's the same message. It's the gospel. However Paul is unpacking it, it's the Bible again and again showing us that the gospel is the big deal. It's all about Jesus. And so what we're doing today is finding that, in in fact, a joyful life is a sinner seized by God. Paul reiterates this right at the beginning. He says, not that I've already obtained this, which is this prize, this this yearning, this striving. I'm I'm not even there. Nor has he obtained, he calls it Christ-likeness. He's not not already in the image of Christ. He's he's striving, he's straining forward. In fact, God is is transforming him. And Paul even says, "I, I just haven't finished the race yet. Yet he strives. He strains, he, he pushes forward, he pulls himself toward God. So how does Paul keep straining? That's the question. How do we live a joyful life? How does Paul keep straining ahead? He says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And that's the verb that I hope you'll pay attention to today because a joyful life is a life seized by God. He, he carries you. He holds you. He, in fact, has rescued you. He's justified you. He's made you right with God through faith in Christ. He took hold of you. The ESV says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. God has took hold of you. Remember some of the past. Abraham, Genesis 12, 15, 17. Abraham is in a land, the land of Ur, they say, and he is confronted by God. God says, I'm going to take you to a new land. He he gave Abraham a new land and not only blessed Abraham, but said in Genesis 12, 15, and 17, I will bless all of those through you, all of those in the world. Moses, in fact, his name means Um, pulled out of or rescued out of the water. Moses, 
He's a, a baby in the water, and yet he's, he's pulled out of the water and placed in Pharaoh's household. And remember David, he's the diminutive little man. He's the, the pipsqueak, and he is, rather than being the strongest and tallest of all of the sons, he's the shortest and weakest, and yet God calls him. He takes hold of him and anoints him the king over Israel. And he's, he's taken hold of you. If you believe in Jesus, he's taken hold of you. And let me just ask the question, because maybe some of you don't know. Has he taken hold of you? Remember the book of Philippians is written to a body of believers. It's not written to a building. There's no address. The book of Philippians is written to the church, which is Christians, people who believe in Jesus. And he's saying... Take hold of Christ because he's taken hold of you. Now, you saw on our screen our uh, youngest daughter. Her name is Emily. Emily runs at about 110% all the time. She's all over the place, and she uh, loves to just go, you know, sometimes not even thinking. And when she was about two, two and a half, she had one of those little puddle jumper jackets on, and we were in Missouri, which has lots of really nice creeks and rivers, and we were picnicking by a creek out in the middle of nowhere. So there's no, no help, no ambulances, no medical care for miles and miles and miles. And Emily decided that she would jump in the creek and very quickly was swept away. And we're sitting on an embankment, and I'm not doing my parental duty, but all of a sudden I can see Emily floating by because she can't stand up and the creek is sweeping her away and my buddy Jonathan, before I even noticed, had already started wading into the water. And she, he just reached down and he pulled her up out of the water and set her on the shore. Well, guess what I wanted to do with Emily the rest of the day? I wanted to hold her. I wanted to hold her tight. Now, if you know Emily, you know that you can't hold on to Emily very long. So she was off again very quickly. But the point is still very clear in my mind and my buddy Jonathan I don't know how many times I still thanked him. This is four or five years ago now. Thanks for rescuing my daughter. God has pulled us up out of the water as well. He's rescued us. He has taken hold of you. And in fact, just like I've said, we're so privileged to be op able to open the Bible and once again, in three progressive verses, see the gospel unpacked for you and for me and let's just let's just look at this how has he how has he taken hold of you if you're a believer who looks to Jesus you believe in Jesus as your savior this is what he's done for you verse 12 not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own remember who's writing this this is Paul He's writing to the church, and he is claiming, he is proclaiming, guys, I am not at all perfect. He is saying, God loves me right in the midst of my mess. And that's true for you and for me. So the first thing that you can see right here is that, in fact, God loves you where you are. He loves you right where you are. Maybe you've heard that in Christian circles. It's maybe cliche to you, but it is in the Bible that even when we are not perfect, he loves you and he loves me. In fact, the Bible says he has made you his own. That's the command here. Make him your own. So first, he loves you where you are. Second, he forgives where you've been. Verse 13 says this, Brothers, and sisters, I do not consider what I have, that I have made it my own. So he's just said, hey, uh, God made me my, his own, and so I'm trying to make him my own. But then he says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. In the NIV text, it says, take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. He continues to confess his imperfection, his progressive sanctification. He's, he's imperfect, but he's being transformed by Christ. And here's what he says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. 
Now, this text here reinforces that God loves you where you are. And sometimes, and some of you are dealing with this right now, I, do, I know I do. You're stuck in the past because you can't give God your sin. There, there are things that haunt you. There are things that haunt me. Maybe it's just a mistake, but sometimes it's sin. It's just outright sin, and you, you can't do what Paul's saying right here and what he's, in fact, even maybe um, encouraging himself as he writes to do, forget what lies behind. That's not to say have amnesia about the past, but rather to say remember who covers that past. In fact, it's, it's up here in verse 9, 10, 11. We talked about this last week. He wants to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own, says Paul, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. He's forgetting what lies behind by saying, I remember, and I often do. Remember, this is the guy that killed people in the church? Can you imagine what it's like to be a murderer and to be chosen by God, pulled out of the situation from killing Christians and then put in a place where, in fact, he's writing letters to encourage their faith? Paul had to live this out. He had sin in his past, and he forgot what lied behind. What was back there? His brokenness, his sin, which was what? Covered by Christ. God loves you where you are, but he also forgives where you've been. And now he calls you heavenward. Verse 14 says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He knows that God loves him where he is, but there's more. He doesn't just leave him where he is. In fact, he loves you enough not to leave you where you are. This is the gospel just simply stated in verse 12, 13, and 14. And what we're seeing again and again is that Paul believes that the gospel is not only for salvation, justification, being made right with God, but it's also for our sanctification, for our lives, for our every single moment by moment, life with the Lord. It's dependent on our faith in Christ. And our future is dependent on that as well. In fact, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says this, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That day has not yet come because that's the day of glory at the day of Jesus Christ that's in the New Testament all over the place that's when Jesus returns God will finish his work says Paul in Philippians 1 and in fact in Romans chapter 8 he says something similar you know this some of you this text in Romans 8 28 says and we know that for those who love God all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose he doesn't just leave us where we are but he transforms us and gives us a purpose. And then he says this, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, many of us miss this part, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of his son. If you believe in Jesus, he loves you where you are. And he's not leaving you where you are. He's conforming us into the image of Christ, which means one thing for sure, Christians should be marked by constant change. Christians should be marked by constant change into the image of Christ. He says right here, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, Jesus will bring all of us with him. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. A joy-filled life is, in fact, a sinner seized by God. We've seen that it's upside down. It's inside out. It's, it's a life poured out. It's a life in Christ. But we also know that God has, in fact, made us his own. He's taken hold of you, and he's taken hold of me. And so because he took hold of you and me, we should take hold of him. We should respond in a way that is fitting of what he's done for us. He's made us his own so we can, and this is Paul, so we can strive. We can strain. It's totally appropriate for Christians to say, we can work hard humbly because he's working in us and through us, but we can still work hard. We don't just rest on our laurels. In fact, what we do 
as we press in. And again, Paul has something to say about this. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you'll see this on the screen, verses 24 to 27, do you not know that in a race all the runners run? Maybe there's a little caveat there, unless you're Richard Hoyt uh, running in a wheelchair. But only one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain it. He says further, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest I myself, after preaching to others, should be disqualified. What he says here is that it's totally appropriate to work hard, to discipline our body and our mind. Remember that uh, being disciplined as a Christian involves a whole person. God didn't just make you a body. He didn't just make you a mind. He didn't just make you a spirit. He made you a whole person. And so he's calling us to press in. And finally, Hebrews chapter 12 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that is, all the people who've come before us, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the, throne, at the right hand of the throne of God. That's the Jesus who's taken hold of you. Has he taken hold of you? Because if he has taken hold of you, then look at him. Know him. See what he has done for you and for me. Worship him, enjoy him, hope in him, celebrate him. If he has made you his own, then make him your own. And as, as one single stab at application for this particular text, remember the joy challenge is our 28-day challenge to try. Well, all that's doing is priming the pump, helping us to remember that we can daily spread the joy. And what, in fact, happens as we're spreading the joy is that we ourselves are experiencing the joy of living in Christ. But here's a stab at application. What single change can you make this week? The church is the people of God, and the church is not the building. And the church, after we continue to worship, after the preaching and after the singing and after the praying, is still the church, and we're going to go out and still be the church for six more days until we come back here, and then we're, what are we going to be? The church. How can you continue as you go out to take hold of Christ? Here, here are some questions that maybe you can begin to ask yourself. What will you take hold of? How will you make him your own this week? There are things that maybe you haven't been able to take hold of, to, to make your own in the Christian life. And one example is, in fact, does God love you where you are? Have you been able to confess that, to own that? Does he love you right where you are? And another one might be, have you been able to forget what is behind? Or are you stuck in the past somehow? Are you stuck on the sin, the mistake that you made? Well, he forgives what's behind. He loves you where you are. He, he forgives what's behind, and he has a future for you. He, he is calling you, and that calling is headed somewhere, but it also has a purpose right now. That, that calling changes your life, much like Dick felt when Rick answered the question, when we were in that race, I felt like I was not disabled. That changed Dick's life for decades. By the way, Dick today is, is in his 80s. And his son would be in his 60s. They're both still alive, as far as I know. And so what we can do is we can hold on more tightly to the gospel. What are some places where you can apply the gospel? Maybe it's the joy challenge. Next month, we'll be um, collecting food for our daily bread in one particular area probably potatoes does anyone like potatoes we've heard that they need potatoes the dry kind um, but that's one way we're going to press in we want to begin serving in a different way next month maybe you need to apply this to your marriage 
Is there a place where you can press in more deeply to apply the truths of Scripture to your marriage? Or your vocation? Is there a way that you might begin exercising uh, faith in your, in your tasks, your daily job? Maybe in your neighbor love, is there a way you might love your neighbors in a way that's faithful to the gospel? Maybe serving in the church. Many of you are, are here for very few uh, weeks or months. Maybe there's a way to serve, maybe in the church. Maybe I know some of you serve on the island in different ways. There are plenty of ways to step in, to lead your family, community, church, and profession. And hear this, just as a final warning, because this is what Paul does. If you look in Philippians chapter 3, um, he, do, he doesn't just say all the fluffy things like, hey, by the way, he loves you, he forgives you, he's got a future for you. Remember last week when he said to the Philippians, hey, don't forget about the evildoers, the dogs, the people who are preaching a different gospel? He kind of does the same thing, and I'm not going to steal Pastor Steve's thunder, but here's where he's going next week, verse 18. So we just read 12, 13, and 14. Here's verse 18. For many of whom I have often told you and tell you even with tears. He's upset about this. He's crying. Walk, some of these people walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory is their shame with minds set on earthly things. That's the opposite. Those are the people who have taken hold of the world or the earthly things and they've let go of God. But what the Bible here and what Paul is doing for you and for me is, is pleading with us to do is to hold on to Christ because he's holding on to you. So what can you hold on to? What can you begin grasping a little bit more deeply? And finally, what can, what can you cast off? Let us throw off, Hebrews 12 says, the things that so easily entangle us, the sin that gets all up in our business. Well, how might you think and act this week in a different way because God has made you his own. Have you thought about it that way before? God makes you his own. He holds you. Maybe there's a way that you can respond by throwing off something. Maybe there's something holding you back from straining, from striving. And maybe it is something like a discipline or a habit that you need to address and give to the Lord. Hey, I'm trying to forget what is behind. God, would you help me to place that in your care? Would you cover it with your righteousness? Don't let it weigh you down. In fact, you can give it to him to forgive, forget what is behind and begin more and more holding on to him because he's holding on to you. Well, I told you Richard and, and Richard, Dick and Rick, they did try to run the 2013 Boston Marathon, but it was canceled because of the bombing. They did run in 2014. They were given all kinds of awards because for decades these guys had been running together over a thousand races. In fact, one of the last races they ran all the way across the country, 3,700 and something miles all the way across the country. They finally ran the Boston Marathon in, in 2014 and after the marathon, the reporters went up to Richard and they, they asked uh, Rick, the younger, the son, hey, um, what's, the, what's the one thing that you would like to, to do for your father? What would you like to give to your dad? Dick is standing there and Rick answered the question. You know, um, in fact, uh, I've got it written down here. It says, the thing that I'd most like, remember he's typing. The thing I'd most like is that my dad sit in the chair and I push him once. You see, the appropriate response to a God who holds us, he has made us his own is that we want to serve him and worship him and enjoy him and recognize that he has done so much for us. And now we respond because he's made us his own. We want to make him our own. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we're grateful indeed that you have made us your own and we turn to you now and ask for help that you might help us to make you our own more and more each day as we own the reality that we're a mess and yet you still love us and you call us more and more into Christ-likeness. We even pray as we continue to worship in song that you would shape us by your spirit. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We also, as an act of worship, we give. And so many of us have been given much. 
Many of us have not, but we give back what the Lord has given to us, to the church, to the work of the kingdom, so that other people might experience that same rescue, that same gospel truth. We do have an ongoing need. Every year we have a budget. Uh, our budget year ends in March. And here's a thermometer that will help you see that we're headed toward the end. We uh, have about $75,000 that we look for by the end of our budget year, which would cover all of our expenses. God has been very faithful to us this last year. We would ask simply that you would give out of the abundance that God has given you. I'm going to pray for those tithes and offerings you can give, by the way, at the baskets on the exits or online. That's how we do it in our family through the app. And I love that metaphor, that picture of the father pushing his son and the son trusting his father. And with that picture in mind, let's sing this together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when the striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, Took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness was scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I am There in the ground his body lay Light of the world by dark Bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. Stand on these promises. No guilt in life. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry. To final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll sing that again. No power. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. I want to do as God's people who's, who he's taken hold of us. And so now take hold of him as you go out 
Here's a benediction from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen.